right, good morning everyone. We are in 2 Kings and we're looking two-ish. <laughs> it's two-ish. If only numbers could work that way. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Chapter one, of course, was uh, Elijah being confronted by 50 men. And chapter 2-ish goes into him being taken away. Uh, We'll go into it. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together uh, this morning in in your name and for your purposes. And thank you that your spirit um, you poured out upon us to draw us into your word and to reveal to us deeper and deeper the the, the love you have, um, the truth that you reveal to us the truth that sets us free, who we are in you, your faithfulness. As we go in, Lord, this morning, please once again open our hearts to see what your your word reveals. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Being two-ish, let's start with verse one-ish around there. Yeah, we'll be we won't be as precise. We'll give ourselves some leeway, some wiggle room. Chapter 2 of 2 Kings. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, "Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel." Or Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel or Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elisha said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elijah had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. He picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Look, they said, we, your servants, have 50 able men. Let them go and look for your master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down on some mountain or in some valley. No, Elisha replied, do not send them. But they persisted until he was too ashamed to refuse. So he said, send them. And they sent 50 men who searched for three days but did not find him. When they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? The men, in verse 19, now the men of the city said to Elisha, look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see, but the water is bad and the land unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, he said, 
and put salt in it, so they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring and threw the salt into it, saying, This is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained wholesome to this day according to the word Elisha had spoken. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel, or Bethel, as he was walking along the road. I love, this is my favorite one of all the scriptures. Pay careful attention. Some young, some youths came out of the town and jeered at him. Go on up, you bald head, they said. <laughs> Go on up, you bald head. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Yeah, that's what you get. And he went on. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there to return to Samaria. I thought about it briefly yesterday because I couldn't sleep that well. I got up early, went for a run and was coming up uh, from the river and um, a mountain lion ran across. I think it was. It was either that or Bobcat. It was a mountain lion. And I was like, well, it's not a bear. No one's jeering me, but it did remind me of this. Mountain lions? Yeah, they're big. I've got cats. Those aren't mountain lions. <laughs> oh, is that right? Well, this one didn't bother with me um, or anybody. There was a few people. It was, but I'll tell you what, man. If I had an outdoor any small dog, that's 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 a snack for that cat. Now, I wanted to go into chapter three for a second, um, and and. Um, Yeah, chapter 3. Joram, son of Ahab, became king of Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. Now, you're going to have this juxtaposition rather between the kings of Israel and the prophets. And, 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 and those two and how they're related to one another. So when we go into chapter 3 go into chapter 3, bear that in mind. In verse 2, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father and mother had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal that his father had made. This is back in 1 Kings chapter 16. Um, Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He did not turn away from them. Now, Mesha, king of Moab, raised sheep, And he had to supply the king of Israel with a hundred thousand lambs and with the wool of a hundred thousand rams. But after Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So at that time, King Joram set out from Samaria and mobilized all Israel. He sent He also sent this message to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? I will go with you, he replied. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. By what route shall we attack, he asked. Through the desert of Edom, he answered, which is just south of of, uh, Jerusalem, south of uh, Judah. Edom being um, Israel's brother, uh, uh, descendants of Esau. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, so now all three, After a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or what the animals or for the animals with them. Yeah, that's because they went south. What exclaimed the king of Israel? Has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to Moab? But Jehoshaphat asked, is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord through him? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. And Elijah, of course, has this reputation. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Elisha said to the king of Israel, what do we have to do with each other? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. No, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to hand us over to Moab. Elisha said, As surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you or even notice you. But now bring me a harpist. 
While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he said, this is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches, for this is what the Lord says. You will, neither, you will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also hand Moab over to you. You will overthrow every fortified city and every major town. You will cut down every good tree, stop up all the springs, and ruin every good field with stones. The next morning, about the time for offering the sacrifice, there it was, water flowing from the direction of Edom. And the land was filled with water, which is impossible because Edom, in terms of where it comes from, does not have a water source to flow. It's not impossible for the water to come from the mountains of the Sierras in here. That's the natural flow of things. But it's not going to flow from a valley in here. And so this is the, the, the dy dynamic that's set up. Um, now all the Moab, this is verse 21 then. Now all the Moabites had heard that the kings had come to fight against them. So every man, young and old, who could bear arms was called up and stationed on the border. When they got up early in the morning, the sun was shining on the water. To the Moabites across the way, the water looked red like blood. That's blood, they said. Those kings must have fought and slaughtered each other. Now to the plunder, Moab. But when the Moabites came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and fought them until they fled. Then the Israelites invaded the land and slaughtered the Moabites. They destroyed the towns, and each man threw a stone on every good field until it was covered. They stopped up all the springs and cut down every good tree. Only Ker, Haraseth, was left with its stone in place. But men armed with slings surrounded it and attacked it as well. When the king of Moab saw that the battle had gone against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through to the king of Edom. A little bit of revenge here, because they're both on the other side of, the, uh, of Israel. But they failed. Then he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king, and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. This is not, this is not uncommon. Um, every 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 single pagan culture practiced this. Every single one. And uh, if you get desperate and you seek a spiritual guidance outside of the Lord, they'll just lead you into destruction. And so this is very common. That's why Abraham didn't balk when God asked him to sacrifice his son because it was so common. It wasn't unusual. God stopped him, of course, but yeah. Um, the fury against Israel was great. They withdrew, I'm sorry. And he took his firstborn son who was to succeed him as king and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. The fury against Israel was great. They withdrew and returned to their own land. So it worked. Let's get into this. <clears throat> I'm just going to take my trust. Oh, look at I've got pens. Pens, pens, pens. Um, as were the widow's oil is the next. Um, you know what? Let's just do a few verses in chapter 4, and then we'll go into uh, some verses that uh, I want to draw our attention to. Chapter 4, then. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? The servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. Then he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Now we're going to go into a number of chapters in which Elisha, similar to Elisha, performs quite a few miracles. Uh, the Shunammite son um, is uh, brought to life starting with verse 8. There's a feeding of the, there's a death in the pot, feeding of the hundred um, layman leprosy. There's going to be a number of them. Chapter 6, the axe head floats. 
And I want to point something out as we go into, um, as we're looking at this. Would you please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is Paul writing to the Corinthian church. Now, um, when Paul, in the book of Acts, when he is going in his missionary journeys, he goes to Athens and he debates them. And there's not much fruit that happens. Um, And then from there he goes to Corinth. And when he's in Corinth, he changes methods a little bit. If, not methods, but uh, his approach. Chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, Paul write, wrote this. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. In fact, you know what? If I don't know how many fingers you got. Hold your, hold your spot there. Go with me to the book of Acts just so that we can, um, I can kind of point out something that's important. Um, and we're... Holding your spot there, going to um, chapter 17. Chapter 17 of Acts, verse 16 says this, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. Verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. And then he goes into and even quotes some of their philosophers. And when you get down to verse, let's say, 32 of that same chapter, it says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Verse 33, then at that, at that, Paul left the council. And the result is a few men became followers of Paul and believed. That's it. Among them, Dionysius, a member of the Arapagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. And that's it. It wasn't this, this, a big movement of the Spirit. When you get to chapter 18, it says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Now, going back to 1 Corinthians, let's take a look at the difference. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he, in going to Corinth, I'm not going to try to get into an argument with you. I, I did with the philosophers, by the way, um, hmm, the word for, anybody know the Greek word for wisdom? Not quite. It, somebody may have a granddaughter named that. Anyone have a grandnaught, granddaughter named Sophia? <laughs> I 
Oh. The word for love is philo. And if you have a love of wisdom, you are a philosopher. That's where the word comes from. Philosophy does not come from Jewish um, background. It comes from Greek. It comes from the Greek tradition of seeking wisdom. And they seek wisdom by way of, remember, of the Greek word for knowledge, ultimate truth, is logos. And this word logos, when we translate it in the book of the Gospel of John, we translate it as the word. The word became flesh. It's this word. And the way that they attain wisdom is to go through the word. Dia means to go through, and you get the word dialogue. So great minds come together and we dialogue, and together we're able to, in theory, get to the word. This is a Greek way. We come together and we, we well, as we saw in the book of Acts, they, they get together in the new, newest idea and all and so forth. That's different than the company of prophets that come together to seek the Lord. Now, the reason why I bring this in play is because when Paul goes to Athens, like we just read in the book of Acts, he engages them where their, their culture resides. Athens is the is this epicenter of philosophy. It is, the, it is a birthplace of philosophy. Aristotle, Plato, the whole thing. Okay, So he engages, and the result is, yeah, a few people believed. Not a lot, but a few. Then he goes to Corinth, and we read again, uh, I in verse 2, I resolve to know nothing. I'm not doing that again. I'm not going to try to convince you. I'm not going to try to use philosophy. I'm, 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 the only thing that I've set my mind in focus of is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what I'm going to preach. I'm not going to try to convince you of the logic of it. I'm not going to try to convince you through argument. I'm not going to try to say, I'm not going to use any human argument. I'm going to set my mind strictly on Christ. And in verse 3, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. That's not a strong, <laughs> that's not a strong leader. And he goes on to say, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. And that is directly in contrast to the Greek value of what we call rhetoric. Rhetoric was the skill that was very much highly regarded as, well, it's almost celebrity status. Anyone that has a very, in our culture, if you have a, a physical skill, and you can throw a, 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 a baseball, you're a celebrity if you're at the top of the line or a football or whatever. We're celebrities, you know, celebrity endorsements, these kind of things. Somehow, if you can, if you can take a basketball and dunk it from, you know, 100 yards out, you know the best shaver to use. Whatever, all right? So that's how it is. In Greek culture, it was the people that were the best at rhetoric. Doesn't matter if it necessarily made sense. Their ability to persuade using words, developing whatever it is that they. Paul's saying, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to use manipulation. To, to try to further the gospel. I'm going to preach Christ and Christ crucified. And then he says at the end of this, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on philosophy, men's wisdom, but on God's power. 
Then, nah, I should have stayed in, in uh, Acts. Um, where were we? 17? Yeah. Um, let me just go back there for a second. Because we take a look at... Um, Uh, 17, when you go to 18, he stays there for a while. There's a big, uh, group of people that get baptized in, in verse eight, Crispus, the synagogue ruler and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard and believed and were baptized. So this was, this was, um, in direct contrast to to his um, to his experience in Athens. Now you go to chapter nineteen, um, let's see where I want to go with. Chapter 19, now, let's, yeah, you know what, we'll start at the beginning. While P Apollos was at Corinth, or still in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, well, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into or in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him, remember, that had just gotten baptized and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of uh, Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. You believe that happened? Or is that just something that the writer put in there to use as a way to manipulate people to believe? Which is the view of what we call biblical criticism. I'm putting this all in context because... As we were looking at uh, Second Kings and all the miracles that are taking place, God, through his spirit, will do what's called signs, S-I-G-N-S, did I do that right? Yeah. And wonders. Okay, and he starts this even in, in Egypt with the various miracles that he's doing, signs, miracles, both and. Jesus' ministry is, is just completely defined by them, whether he's casting out an unclean spirit, whether he's healing somebody, whether he's feeding 5,000, whether he's walking on water, they're everywhere. And the mark of the Holy Spirit is oftentimes marked with these demonstrations that testify to the authority. The Holy Spirit is not the only one, and this is important to understand, is not the only one that can do miracles. There are other spirits opposed to God that have some ability, supernatural ability too. And you see this back in the book of Exodus when Moses goes back to Pharaoh, 
and takes his, his, his staff. Throws it down. Staff becomes a snake. Pharaoh brings in his charmers. Magicians, I think is how we translate it. And they do the same thing. Anyone remember the, the result? Moses eats, yeah. Moses gets a big old honking steak after that. Because his eats that. But the demonstration is that, well, there's supernatural power that's happening here. Then it's the river. He, and, and Moses turns it into blood. They do the same thing. Eventually, they get to the point where we can't do this. This is the hand of God. Now, in 2 Kings and throughout all of Scripture and today, this is to be expected. As we see here. However, this is just one aspect, if you will, of the Holy Spirit's work because just as important, or maybe even more important, is His work within us that develops character. Signs and wonders. So for example, in the Gospel of John, there's 5,000 people that are getting kind of hungry. Jesus takes the five small loaves and the two fish, you know the story, gives thanks and is able to feed everybody. And after they realize, whoa, this is a miracle. This is the prophet. As it says, um, after the crowd realized what Jesus did, they began to say, certainly this is the prophet who is to come. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Then he walks on the water. But the only people that see that are the twelve. When he lands on the other side, Capernaum, and the people that were on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, catch up with him, they asked him, when did you get here? And his response immediately is, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils. And they get into this thing. Because signs and wonders are always intended to give testimony to the authority of the message. But signs and wonders are not what transform us into the character that God is working in us. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't, He doesn't work through signs and wonders. He works through His Word. So, now I often wondered, how could the Israelites experience all those miracles, go through the Red Sea, and then start complaining? And then Moses gives them food. And then they still complain. And, and it's, just this, it's just this cycle that we're seeing in 2 Kings. Starting with Elijah, going on with Elisha. There are signs and wonders. It gives um, Elisha or Elisha authority. It testifies to their authority. This is the miracles that Jesus did. Even in the Gospel of John, it says, I think this is chapter 12, even though Jesus did these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Even though it was right in front of them. But 
the work of the Holy Spirit, as we see repeatedly, more pronouncedly in the Gospel of John. I, if you love me, you will keep my commands. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. To be with you forever. My presence, I, my presence will always be with you. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you. And then he goes on. The Spirit will remind you, will lead you into all truth and remind you of everything that I've said. A definite role. Later on, the Spirit will test. When I go to the Father, he, I, will, he, I will have him send you the Spirit, and the Spirit will testify about me. You also must testify. So the Spirit bears witness. When I send the Spirit, he will convict the world, meaning to give a solid conviction, meaning I have the, the courage of my convictions. I know what I know, and I, and I stand in what I know, and nothing can, can thwart me from that. There is a knowing, a knowing that only the Spirit can give. They call that conviction. Faith is an aspect of that conviction because character has everything to do with faith. And I don't mean doctrines. I mean loyalty. What we're seeing in contrast in 2 Kings is the northern t ten tribes disloyalty or faithlessness or unfaithfulness to the Lord. They believe in him. They're just not being faithful. So Elijah and Elisha are both demonstrating with signs and wonders their authority to speak on behalf of the Lord. And they don't just do it to do it to do a show. Hey, Elisha's coming into town. Tickets go on sale Friday night. Come and see the miracles. No, they do that so that they, they publicly have a display of God's authority so that they can speak the word of the Lord in an authoritative way manner to the king none of the prophets that are false prophets are able to do what elijah and elisha are able to do through the through the lord they can do some things they can't do everything um and character is the most important in and how this plays out in our lives, if you will, is he gives us his word, and then we will go through a trial, if you will. And the trial then, any kind of trial or test, allows us to exercise or practice or, or discover, really. See, no, none of us knows how much faith we have until you're in a trial, right? You can go into an assembly and rah, 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 God, and, and that's cool. Um, praising God and so on is great. But you don't know how much faith you have until you go through a trial. And then you go, oh, remember, faith does not originate with you. It originates with God. So it's his gift in you that he's, he's demonstrating to you. And what happens in, in that trial is you start praying or asking God for the miracle. Anyone ever pray to God for the miracle? And more times than not, nope. Because he's developing character. He's developing that no matter what comes my way, you are faithful. You are able to heal me, but even if you don't, I still trust you. I still worship you. I still praise you. 
I do question you. Anybody ever question God in the last hour? And God knows this because this is part of discipleship. All through Jesus' ministry, he calls the 12 in particular to follow him, and he works it. They see the miracles. And then you get to chapter 6, which is what we're reading now in John, and unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, it, what? this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? And then after, the, after a while, it's like, we're out of here. From that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus looks at the 12, you want to leave too? And Peter, that bastion of confidence. Yeah, where else are we going to go? It's not like, but he does follow it through. Where else are we going to go? We know that you, you are the Holy One of God. And there's this conflict then, you see. And to understand that, and, and this is very, very, um, this happens to every single person that follows Christ in their own unique way. There'll be a, a sign or, or, or sign or, or wonder that, that testifies to what God is doing. Sometimes it's real small, sometimes it's really big, whatever. And then there's the testing period. Where, okay, now I'm building character. So that because if you got every single thing that you wanted from God, you wouldn't develop faith. You wouldn't develop character. You would develop a superficial dependency on the performance of God as compared to the truthfulness of his word. His word is truthful no matter what we go through, period. No matter how I feel, no matter how despair I may be, he is faithful. And if I rely solely on the miracles, he cannot do the transformative work. Uh, Paul says it last week yesterday when we were in our men's group. Do not be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to know what God's will is. His good and perfect will. And so, um, let's take a look at... Uh, Roman and, and and well, let me just check, check. Why is this important? Because without this, huh, but without character, you cannot reign with God. Take a look at um, Matt, the chap, blah, 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 Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 19. Chapter 19 of Matthew, verse 27. Peter answered him, we've left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth at the renewal of all things. When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. It's a matter of faithfulness and character development, 
that leads to our ultimate purpose, which is to inherit and to reign with God. But you can't, and to reign with God, but let's uh, swing on over to um, the last book of the Bible, Revelation. We'll go to the last chapter of that book. Chapter 22, um, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. Oh, oh my God. No longer. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever. This is our eternal state, to reign with God. But it will require character. The only way, the only way to develop character is through suffering. It's the only way. Do we all wish it was not that way? but it is the only way. Now, without the Spirit of God within us, it would, the suffering would crush us. But the pressure of the suffering, and that's what it is, when people suffer, they weigh, it weighs them down. You can see it in the count, their countenance. They're not, what do we say when we're happy? Oh, I'm, they're so light and happy. But when they're going through something, they're not light and happy. They're weighted. They're burdensome. What, what the devil intends to crush us, God uses to transform us. It's only through time and pressure. Only through time and pressure. That a diamond can be formed. Without that, it doesn't happen. And that's what some of us are going through. I mean, you can question, why isn't he answering our prayers? Well, you got to, this is where then his word comes in. Teach us how to pray. Okay. It's like a widow. I've been talking about this a lot because it's very, it's, 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 it's so powerful in its truth. It's like a widow who went to an unjust judge. You ever have to deal with the bureaucracy? Every day, trying to find the parking lot. And then you get there and you just sit there. And then, no, he doesn't, they don't care about you. It's, the judge doesn't care. Doesn't want to hear your case. Go home. I'm going to show up again. I mean, how long does it take before you just feel completely defeated? It's like a widow that, that's, that's facing that every day and has absolutely no expectation of getting what she wants. She cries out to, uh, for justice, but nothing's happening. And then finally, odds against odds, the judge, unjust judge, says, ah, give her what, he, what she wants. I'm tired of her always coming here. And in that, it almost appears as if Jesus is saying that God is like the unjust judge. That's exactly what he's saying. He's not saying that he is. He's saying that's what it's going to feel like. So don't give up. When you feel that way, don't give up. And there are times in, in the body of Christ in which we're able to support one another, be, for, be there for one another, etc. 
it. There are times in which you will go through something that is just for you. And, and God will, in those situations, just develop or, or design it so that he can develop your faith. What is faith? So, so let us rejoice in our sufferings, as Paul says, because suffering, let us rejoice. I didn't say have a party. Let us rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces what? Perseverance. The ability to disregard what you're feeling and to get the job done. I don't care if I don't want it. I don't want to get out of bed. What do I have to live for? These are all experiences of spiritual resistance. And yet, you put the foot down, you put the other foot forward, tell the cat to get out of the way, and you go on. And you just do it one step in front of the other. That's perseverance. When when you're persevering, you can't push forward like, oh, I'm going to get a lot done. Uh Uh-uh. Have you ever had to persevere? You're not, oh, I'm going to get a lot lot done today. No, you're not. You're going to, first of all, get out of bed. And that's the only thing you can think about. And once you're out of bed, then we'll think about, you know, like when you're not suffering or anything, you plan out your whole day. I, yeah, the whole day, I'm just going to do all this, I'm going to do all this, I'm going to do all, I'm going to get a lot accomplished. When you're in suffering, eh, let me just do this. And this may be all I can do for the day. And when I get done with this, then maybe I'll do this. But this is teaching you how to live by the power of grace of God and His Spirit. And it's developing character. For, let us rejoice in our sufferings because we know the suffering produces character. Character. I'm sorry, perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope, and it's, assur- it's assurance, not wishful thinking hope, and hope doesn't disappoint us. So both, as we're going through right now in, in 2 Kings, But all through the scriptures, there's these two things. There's character, which deals with faith, meaning to be loyal. This is character. And signs and wonders. I really thought, I didn't know, but once the Lord gave me, or the Spirit gave me the gift of tongues, that I could be kind of, I don't know, some spiritual magician. No, not at all. Not at all. And then I think, well, then what good is a gift? I mean, you know, you, you work these things out. God give, puts a miracle and does something miraculous in your life, and then you're going through this. I'm like, well, what good was a miracle for? I mean, you demonstrated this miracle, and now this? I thought you were a God of miracles, but now you're not doing anything? And this is what, this is the process of discipleship. This is why at, at, at one point in time, Peter prays and the angel comes down and opens up the gate and Peter goes out and it's a miracle. But that doesn't happen every time. He ends up dying upside down on a cross. But he doesn't die upside down on a cross in fear or disbelief or worry or anxiety, but with confidence and joy because his character has been developed. And many of you, if not all of you, are going through some kind of character development. You really don't have a choice. You're going to get old if you don't know that. And uh, things are going to start aching. And you're going to lose control over things that you had control over. And there's going to be a pull to let that defeat you as compared to learning to lean into God, as Paul says, though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed. We're being renewed. Well, that's a pretty good news, don't you think? But you're not going to see that on the corner here of 
Coloma and Sunrise, Somerset, come be renewed. I always wanted to join that thing because it looks like they're having a party all the time. You know, it's like, okay. So this is important to see as we go through this because m- miracles, they do happen. I, I, I know, I know that when I'm praying for something, God can do it. If he, but that doesn't mean he's going to do it in my way, in my time frame, or if he's even going to do it. But regardless, he is still God because his word is faithful regardless of my expectation. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to close off the window and say, no, God doesn't do miracles anymore. That's not true. I've seen it enough, experienced it enough to know that it's true. But it doesn't circumvent God's working, char- working out character in our lives. Okay? I've gone too far. So we'll end there and uh, continue on. Uh, later time. Take a five minute break and if you want to join us in prayer, I got the AC going on. We'll do some prayer. Um, And let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for for speaking to us today and for working out this gift of faith that you've given us. We are truly learning how to persevere. And please teach us Help us to learn how to habitually seek you in all things, in all conditions, in all circumstances. For you want to be known, and you do reveal yourself. And all this we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen.